in, 19, in 2012, uh, there was a moment in history which places the issues I'm about to discuss into perspective. Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi produced a constitution which said that uh, he was beyond the courts, above the law, and uh, wasn't answerable to the power of judicial review. And the world cried out in anguish and criticism uh, because it, be it had become accepted that uh, judicial review was a foundation of liberty. Where did that foundation come from? In America, we're a republic, and in a republic, majority, or at least the representatives of the majority, usually govern. But there are limits. And those limits are part of the complex set of checks and balances, which include judicial independence. In America, a democratic republic, the role of the judges is to interpret the law as given by the legislatures and the people. But the discretion of the judges is supposed to be narrow, and their function is supposed to be judicial. A few months before John Adams achieved his goal of a Declaration of Independence, he identified the issue as central to the issues dividing Britain and America. The dignity and stability of government in all of its branches, the morals of the people, and every blessing of society depends so much upon an upright and skillful administration of justice that the judicial power ought to be distinct from both the legislative and the executive. Problem is, this principle, which you all know well, uh, grew out of very messy conflicts, very petty political battles, and that's the story I want to tell you today. Adams went on to say, the judge's mind should not be distracted with jarring interests. It should not be dependent upon any man or body of men. To these ends, they should hold their estates for life in their offices, or in other words, their commission should be during good behavior. And that's the principle that was written into Article Three of our Constitution. Judges were not to be dependent on the political process. They were to be immune from politicians and from politics. However, judicial independence began to be a much broader principle. John Adams transformed the Supreme Court from what Alexander Hamilton promised would be the least dangerous branch into the most powerful court the world has ever known. And ever since, Americans have been complaining about it. Most constitutional courses begin with Marbury versus Madison, but in truth, Marbury would have meant little to America had Thomas Jefferson succeeded in his quest to tear apart judicial independence immediately after his inauguration in March of 1801. You may know some elements of the story. In 1800, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson ran against each other. The Adams administration was defeated, and so was the Federalist Party, which Adams led. The Federalists then used a very extended time where a lame duck Federalist Congress would be in power to create offices for party faithful and to place as many of them into office as they could before Thomas Jefferson became president. When Jefferson does become president, he ordered a comprehensive assault on the judiciary. The Jeffersonians argued that judicial independence undermines majority rule. Lifetime service permits elitism, corruption, and aristocratic rule. What's not so well known, because it really doesn't help us think very well of Thomas Jefferson, is that he succeeded in a lot of this. He passed legislation stripping federal courts of jurisdiction, and the court bowed deeply and deferentially and upheld the Jeffersonian jurisdiction stripping law. The Chief Justice of the United States, who had minimum high regard for his cousin Thomas Jefferson, worried about another element of the Jeffersonian assault, and that's the impeachment and removal of federal judges. The Jeffersonians targeted Samuel Chase, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, appointed to the court in 1796. He suffered the nickname Old Bacon Face 
which is about the best way I could provide a portrait to you without having one on hand. He opposed ratification of the Constitution because it lacked a Bill of Rights. In an early decision, Calder versus Bull attended the defense of the power of the courts to interpret and enforce natural law. Now, like, like many politicians of the day, Chase seemed to change his point of view uh, and his political affiliations depending upon whether he was happy with Thomas Jefferson or not. And so he ran his court the same way. After the elect election of 1800, he denounced Jefferson, denounced him for all that he did, and that, in part, what got him targeted as a uh, first attempted impeachment of a justice of the Supreme Court. The House did impeach him. They alleged that he behaved in an arbitrary and oppressive way. He rendered his legal opinions uh, on the law and then refused to allow defense counsel to make their own arguments. He was guilty of political excess, threatening political institutions, and uh, he tended to prostitute the high character of the court in which he was uh, serving to, quote, the low purpose of an electioneering partisan. Now, we've heard arguments like this about justices from time to time. We even hear them today. The issues were sensational. They were fundamental. Two clauses were relevant. One spoke of judges holding office for good behavior, John Adams' principle, and the other spoke in terms of impeachment and removal for high crimes and misdemeanors. Could a judge be impeached for expressing unpopular political opinions? Chase was accused of bullying lawyers and other judges. Was such misconduct enough for removal? Judges were to serve for life assuming good behavior. Could a judge really be removed for bad behavior that wasn't criminal misconduct? Politics and the rule of law were in the balance. At the time the Senate took up the House case against Samuel Chase, its members included 25 Jeffersonians, then called Republicans, and nine Federalists. A straight party line vote would remove Chase. If a Republican majority did their president's bidding, independent judicial behavior would be endangered. John Marshall took the threat so seriously, he wrote privately of ways in which he might be able to parry these thrusts. And he even, at one point, in private correspondence, recommended submitting unpopular Supreme Court opinions to the Congress where they might be overruled, which would have cut the guts out of the power of judicial review. Justice Chase, old bacon face, appeared before the Senate in January of 1805. His lawyers alleged that he was being tried for his politics rather than for his judicial conduct. The presiding officer was the Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. You all know the name Aaron Burr, I'm sure. He's rarely remembered as a hero. He has been described as an opportunist, a villain, and a scoundrel, and worse. Uh, here's a trick for you. If you want to enhance your historical reputation, you don't have the most prominent men of the day denounce you. He managed to be denounced by Washington, Adams, Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison, all of whom distrusted him, and for good reason. A few recent histories have tried to rehabilitate him with mixed results. But the story here is that Burr, at the end of his political career, did his job. He did what he was supposed to do. Burr owed little to Jefferson. They had actually ended up as rivals in the House election for the presidency in 1800. Burr played games. Jefferson won and never forgave Burr for what he regarded as his betrayal. Another participant in this effort was Alexander Hamilton, lifelong rival of Jefferson, who ends up supporting Jefferson largely because he thinks Jefferson's more trustworthy than Burr. This is only the beginning 
of the deterioration in the personal relationship between Burr and Hamilton. That ended up in a duel, the most famous duel in American history, where Aaron Burr became the first sitting vice president to shoot someone. He killed Alexander Hamilton in July of 1804. And only a few months later, he's there presiding over the Senate, and the question before the Senate is the rule of law. Federalist courts were not too happy about their murder, the murder of their hero uh, presiding over the impeachment trial of a Federalist judge. One of them wrote, it was the practice of the courts of justice to arraign the murderer before the judge, but now we behold the judge arraigned before the murderer. Now many senators hoped or feared that Burr would cooperate and allow a rush to judgment, but he did not. He gave Chase the opportunity to present a full defense. By all accounts, Burr set a good standard for fairness in running the trial. There are some complaints that Burr exercised too much influence in the proceedings, and the United States Senate quickly moved to make sure no one would ever again. But the Federalist senators who were in the minority spoke only praise for a man they otherwise hated. Samuel Taggart, a Federalist from Massachusetts, wrote, I could almost forgive Burr for any less crime than the blood of Hamilton for his decision, dignity, firmness, and impartiality. He is undoubtedly one of the finest presiding officers I have ever witnessed. Chase himself might not have been so enthusiastic in assessing the behavior of the Vice President. Burr unnerved Chase by interrupting when he saw fit. Chase was reported to have been near tears as Burr cross-examined him. The vice president shared the prevailing view that Chase was a bully. He made it a habit to hector and badger defense attorneys. He made arbitrary and impulsive rulings. He took punitive action against grand juries that refused to do his bidding. And Burr managed to come up with a method of cross-examining him that gave him just what he had offered others. But Burr decided to teach the bully a lesson but give him a chance to defend himself. Six Jeffersonian Republicans joined nine Federalist senators to vote not guilty on all articles. The Senate acquitted Samuel Chase on all counts. A majority voted guilty on three counts, but far short of the two-thirds necessary for removal. As the distinguished historian Charles Warren observed, the acquittal was an important event in the development of an independent judiciary. The Senate effectively insulated the judiciary from removal for unpopular opinions. A chastened chase resumed his duties on the bench. Thomas Jefferson was furious. John Marshall, Chief Justice, was relieved. But the rule of law survived, not because of a court ruling, but only because the scoundrel, Aaron Burr, the great villain of the America's founding period, and six Jeffersonian senators helped to make sure that Thomas Jefferson failed in his vendetta. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.